It's my very great pleasure to introduce our next speaker of the series, uh, Professor Ron Amundsen of the Department of Environmental Science and Policy Management, which we usually love to call SESCOM, uh, is going to talk to us today about the um, Atacama Desert in Chile and an archaeological area I think that will be of great interest to many people in the room. And I am just going to turn things over to Ryan right because I want to hear what you have to say. All right. Thank you. ESPM, and I am a soil scientist and earth scientist, and so I have been working in Chile for 15 years. And my reason for going there didn't have anything to do with archaeology, and I have to say that for years I kind of tried to ignore things that had to do with current stuff because I didn't want to get sidetracked from working on what I went down there to do originally, which was to, I got started with a NASA uh, funding to use the Atacama Desert as an Earth analog for Mars. And I've still been kind of doing that. And here I have one of my colleagues, Bill Dietrich, who uh, tagged along with me a few times and is actually studying Mars now. So we're, it is a very important Earth location for understanding uh, the chronic effects over millions of years of extreme aridity on the environment. And I've done projects to look at the, uh, the long term, when, when the desert became the desert, back in the Miocene or Pliocene, uh, we've looked at the effect of, these, of aridity on the geochemistry of soils and what that can tell us about past climate and also inform us about what the history of Mars is. But in the last five or six years, we were looking at big scale questions on the evolution of the desert, the erosion, and we were driving back and forth across landscapes like you see in this picture here, which we knew essentially must be a dry lake bed, but we had initially not too much interest in exploring when it was a lake and, and its history and so forth. This is actually, um, if you look across this landscape, there's this road leading out across this dried lake bed, and it's really, it's about uh, this thick of rock hard sodium chloride. The lake, it's just a cemented uh, lake, a bumpy road going across this lake bed. We thought it was an interesting thing, but I never thought as we went along that it would eventually be relevant to thinking about archaeological questions. And so I'm going to give you a little overview today of um, uh, part, of a pro part of my grad student's PhD project, who is here right now, Marco Pfeiffer is right here in the middle of the room. This is part of Mar uh, one part of Marco's PhD dissertation. And then I'll talk about some new work that I've started uh, with my colleagues, uh, Claudio Latore and Calagero uh, Santoro from Chile, and their, and their students, postdocs, and colleagues uh, to about things linking up my our observations on the paleo hydrology and uh, the connection to recent developments and discoveries in, in, in archaeology in the region. So one of the, I guess there's kind of a, I guess we're at the point uh, in our studies and, and research in South America now where we're sort of at a point where a lot of the old myths and uh, sort of predisposed ideas are starting to fade away. And one myth, well, it's not a myth, it's really true, the, the de and I'll talk about this today, ongoing work on lakes and, and new archaeology. So the myths are that the desert is lifeless. Well, it truly is today, but the buried underneath this is what I'm going to talk about, is that there's subtle oscillations in maybe not the climate of the desert, but the climate of the nearby Andes that are feeding water sporadically and periodically into the desert that change have probably greatly changed the character of what we see today on uh, very short uh, geological time scales. The other thing is 10 years ago, and I'll show you a paper uh, that sort of set out what was known about a decade ago, this was considered, the desert was considered to be an archaeological free zone, that people had moved up into the Altiplano of the Andes, they had inhabited the coast, but had largely avoided this interior. And a lot of this is now sort of melting and fading away. And we're developing, a, I think, a more complicated and complex perspective 
of the peopling of South America. Now, it's hard not to be totally impressed by how dry it is when you're there. This is, uh, uh, I was out there a year ago with Marco and, uh, and my Chilean colleagues. This is uh, typical of the desert. It's, it's a life, it's an absolute desert in biological terms. There's no plants. Uh, th there's not enough water to support plants and unless there's groundwater here and there that's providing a little oasis. Very few insects. There's a few that are surprisingly here and there. But essentially an almost abiotic environment. And it's hard not to be impressed when you're out there and when you know that there's archaeological sites out there to wonder how in the world this ever was inhabitable or habitable. This is another photo of my Chilean colleagues making a mess in the desert uh, driving to uh, an archaeological site. The landscape, in addition to being dry, is covered with a mantle of uh, windblown dust and, so, and uh, sulfate salt. And it's just so dry that this stuff doesn't dissolve or, or, or disappear. And you drive across this landscape, gets stuck in the dust. And it's an incredibly uh, inhospitable environment. And then while you're walking around in all this stuff, you find things like this. This is a ball my colleagues uh, found. They suggested it was a part of a, a, a toy or plaything used by uh, the people that lived there uh, several thousand years ago. Walk across the landscape, you find these lithic uh, materials. And even more surprising, when you're out in the midst of this absolute desert, out you stumble across some things and you dig it up, and it's a tree trunk. So there's sort of this. Uh, dichotomy of this incredible aridity today and yet a perspective that things were different not too long ago and it's been the fun part of this sort of recent work that I've done that sort of uh, are un is unveiling sort of the unique uh, things that have happened out here in the uh, in the last 10,000 to 12,000 years so this is sort of where the state of archaeology knowledge about the desert was when I first went down there in 2001. This came out in 2002. It's written by the, uh, the famous uh, Chilean archaeologist Nunez. And he and his colleagues at that point outlined uh, the known archaeological sites in this part of uh, Chile and South America. And they were all concentrated up here in what are the, uh, essentially the Andes, the Altiplano, the high plateau that is truly actually not a desert. There's actually plants, there's rainfall, snowfall. But it's pretty dry, pretty cold. But it showed the distribution of known archaeological sites. And I put this red line in here to s essentially show that there was nothing shown on the map for what is the low elevation uh, dry desert region. And one of the things that Bill and Marco and I have found is we were just wandering geologists and we stumbled on all of these red stars are places where we had found either lithic chipping, um, abandoned shelters, or some combination thereof that uh, reflected uh, archaeological activity. So this was to me kind of a revelation and uh, it was sort of a, a curiosity more than anything. It took us a long time to actually uh, get up the energy and overcome the inertia to bring in or get involved with archaeologists to explore this a little bit more and that's what I'll be talking about today. The, the thing that really uh, drew us in is the discovery of the site called Mani. It's on the uh, Quebrada Mani. It's a um, Paleolithic site that my colleagues uh, Claudio Latore and, and Caligero Santoro have uncovered. And so that led into the, it sort of led to us tying into uh, my geos, geohydrology work into their, uh, into their archaeology. So they've created sort of a more updated perspective on, on archaeology in this part of uh, South America. They've got divided this up into three zones, a coastal zone. This yellow area is the true absolute desert region of the Atacama. And then the stuff to the right is sort of the Altiplano. And each little dot represents an archaeological site. And you can see they're, they're all sort of converging on dates between 10 and 12,000 years. And the Quebrada Mani, which they've uh, worked on, the oldest date associated with archaeological 
information is about 12,800 years. And so this is pushing back uh, human occupation uh, pretty far in time, but it's part of this overall pattern that's starting to emerge of occupation in the desert. And later in this talk, I'll just give you a little update on quite an extensive area of activity that we're just starting to explore much further south. It's also right in the belt of uh, hyperaridity. So the Mani site, uh, here they are uh, excavating it. They're, it's on, it's basically in the middle of this absolute desert. It's on a uh, ancient or Miocene uh, river terrace that's sort of stranded and it's been cut around by a uh, subsequent uh, incision of the streams coming off the Andes. Uh, when they did the survey, they walked across the site, they found all sorts of lithics uh, scattered along the surface. And then adjacent to it to the south is a modern drainage and to the north is a sort of Pleistocene drainage that's in there. And also, uh, not shown on here, there's all sorts of post 2000 year old um, uh, agricultural fields, canals, uh, drainage systems. So there was an extensive sort of late Holocene uh, period of stream activity that sort of brought in the Neolithic sort of and, and the agriculturalists late in the game. But this is the Mani site, the early, the late Pleistocene um, site. They show the, the artifacts scattered over the surface. What they found on the surface were these, uh, these are the points that were just laying on the surface. And I, I find it interesting about humans. So one, I, around Mani, this is just uh, maybe 100 meters across, 200 meters across. And down here must have been thousands or hundreds at least of farmers. And I asked uh, Caligaro if he found any sort of farmer at, uh, debris on top of that uh, terrace. And he said, no, no, apparently nobody either went up there or they didn't bring any stuff up with them. But it's, it's a baffling to me that there could have been people here for hundreds, thousands of years farming and they didn't leave anything up on the, on the ridge. But nonetheless, they left all the, the, the Paleolithic people left this stuff. They found gastropods, uh, spear tips, uh, camelid bones with uh, uh, tool marks in it, and a lot of lithic products around there. So it's quite a, quite an extensive uh, occupation. And then the one site that they really excavated in detail they found some ex evidence here of a uh, hearth, hearth or some sort of fire pit with uh, evidence of uh, heating of the material and some uh, burning. So this was at least a, um, uh, uh, a semi-occupied area for some period of time. And th the evidence suggests that around it on both sides was a riparian zone, that now very dry uh, channel on both sides was fed by runoff from the Andes and it must have been a very luxuriant and rich and vibrant uh, biotic zone that provided the resources to the people that were uh, living here. So people did traverse and inhabit the desert, but the other thing that's part of what we're working on here is to unravel a lot more about the uh, hydrological history and what the overall uh, scope of the desert looked like maybe at the uh, at the end of the Pleistocene. So um, here is the Mani site uh, right here. It's along a, a stream called the Corbrada Mani, Mani that drains or uh, heads up in the uh, in the sort of pre-Andean area. There's been work done uh, between the Chileans and some folks from Cornell that have looked at terraces and uh, biotic remains and some of these streams coming out of the Andes and they get a variety of ages in the early late Pleistocene early Holocene and then there's sort of some very late Holocene evidence of, uh, of stream activity but what it sort of begs the question is what was the whole region like during this period we, we have a hint now that water was moving through these corridors but what was going on in the basins? And, and this is a map from uh, Claudio's paper showing three large uh, salt covered basins now. And so what we're gonna do now is take a look at what we're learning about the history of these uh, salt covered basins. The other thing that's emerged uh, from the, uh, all the work that other people have done, not so much that what we've accomplished so far, is that there's been evidence for two big uh, 
pluvial periods, uh, one between 18,000 and maybe 14,000, and then from 13 down to about 10,000. These are called Cape 1 and 2 events, Central Andean pluvial episode events. Uh, Cape 2 is the one that corresponds to the earliest archaeological record. Um, the, the, the data that my colleagues have around this area clump into these two areas and we'll see that lake evidence also seems to suggest that there was these areas were filled with water or partially filled with water at various times during Cape 1 and Cape 2 events. And then there was a later period uh, in the late Holocene that also probably had uh, significant water. So I, this is sort of an accidental thing. We, uh, as I mentioned, my co uh, colleague Arjun Heimsath and I were focused on big scale stuff and either just through touristy sort of things that we're doing or just wandering around and just looking at things, we were sort of sucked into this sort of late uh, quaternary history of the area and we've sort of uh, stumbled onto dates for uh, pluvial episodes for the Salar Pintados, Bella Vista, and uh, Yamara to the south. And I'll talk, talk a little bit about some of the things we've seen and some of the dates that we've uh, generated on this. So this is part of Marco's uh, PhD dissertation. And so the more overall scope that Marco's working on We've looked at a lot of outcrops along these lakes. Uh, the miners, uh, one thing about Chile is there's salt mining just about everywhere. So there's excavation holes in all sorts of locations. So we've looked at a lot of outcrops, done some logging of these outcrops. We're developing a radiocarbon database. We have more samples to date as well. And one of the things that we're going to do is calculate the extent and volume of these lakes and, and sort of outline the periphery to sort of inform us more about where to look for other archaeological settlements and, and inform the future archaeological excavations. And the one challenging thing that Marco's trying to work on now is to calculate changes in the regional ground flow using hydrological models that would cause the Salars to fill. So this is part of a, a series of steps that are leading into an overall and uh, richer history of this area. Well, the Salar Pintados is, is, I guess, for me as a, as just a, as a tourist, it's an interesting archaeological area. It's a now site of a national park that has been set up to sort of preserve uh, all the amazing array of geoglyphs that are found on the, the nearby hills. And the salar in, in Spanish essentially is the term for a salt-covered flat basin or lake bed. Largely the boundary between the salar is right about where we're standing here. Uh, and then there's some gravelly area, beach area in the background, and then these hills in the back where uh, people over time have created these uh, amazing geoglyphs. If you look down on it <coughs> from Google Earth, this is a scale bar up there of 150 meters. You can kind of see the geoglyphs on the hill. This is a rough boundary between the basin and the, uh, the geoglyphs. And then there's this salt-covered dry lake bed in the background. And when we were there a few years ago, they were just building a new visitor center. And they built a walkway out onto the flat. And they dug a trench all the way through it, which opened up uh, the stratigraphy, and to our surprise, we found basically uh, what appears to be freshwater marl underneath all this salt. So the, what you see here is since the, the dates we have on this are about 11,000 years, and, and they are calibrated to calendar years, so 11,200 or so years old. So basically since that was a freshwater environment, the water table has dropped. There's been capillary movement of water and solutes. And the evaporation has basically left this thick, rock-hard uh, zone of sodium chloride on the surface. So that's that rugged-looking topography in the background. But then underneath it, there's a zone of uh, fine-grained soil with a lot of rhizoliths from plants. And that gave us some ages of about 11,100. Below that are some marl layers, about very, well, 
fine-grained, almost pure calcium carbonate uh, gave us ages of just over 11,000 years. So this was a quite a different environment. And the interesting thing is this is within the time frame of known human occupation. So this could have been an area for resources for people then. And so it, it sort of uh, allows us to extrapolate the periphery of this uh, wetland or lake, small lake area and project where there might be uh, the outlines of this area to look for uh, future occupations. Down at Bella Vista, there's a, a lot of trenching that's gone on uh, for salt mining purposes, and they uh, opened up a number of really cool things. We found shorelines with uh, plants and so forth. This is sort of in the middle of the basin, if you will. These lakes were probably only a few meters thick at their, at their thickest point during the, the late quaternary. So they wouldn't be extensive or large lakes. But there's quite a history here. There's uh, some dipping, uh, bet, uh, very sordid and imbricated uh, gravels that look like shoreline layers. Above it is a thick zone of diatomaceous material. That we have one dated sample from this from a um, carbonate in a wave, uh, a wave feature right below the salt crust. That's 25,000 years old. And the diatoms, Marco, and Marco has been working with uh, the folks down in Chile. And it's a mix of fresh to saltwater species that are in there. So there's a variety of environments reflected by the, the diatoms, but including freshwater environments that were in these uh, lake sediments. Also, we found in Pintados, we found shells. Uh, these are uh, sands uh, that have in them these uh, freshwater shells that we've dated. These, these, were, these came out about 16,500 years. So they reflect a very different environment than what we, uh, that what we see here today. One of the features that strike you when you drive across these uh, dry lake beds are these humpy mounds that are found across the landscape. And what these are uh, appear to be coppice dunes around the periphery of these uh, ancient uh, lakes and marshlands. Uh, the wind was blowing uh, sand around. You can find modern analogs of this. Tamarugo trees are the uh, or basically a mesquite sort of species nowadays live in, or you can find these associated with these coppice dunes. And if you uh, drive through some of these road cuts through these dunes, again, there's the ubiquitous sodium chloride crust over it. But occasionally, you can find trunks or branches of these uh, fossil uh, uh, mesquite trees. And in this particular outcut, crop, we dated it, and it was about 12,700 years old. So again, there's sort of pieces of the puzzle. In, this, in the Solar Bella Vista, we have sort of basin deposits. We have shoreline uh, plants and so forth we found. And then we have information on the ages and t nature of these sort of coppice dunes that were uh, surrounding the area. Near, I should say, near the, um, in another lake basin around these coppice dunes, we found a lot of uh, artifacts, uh, hammers and tools that uh, appear that this would have been a, a, a not an area for people to exploit or at least utilize. And so, we, but we haven't done any archaeological uh, uh, excavate uh, sort of walks through this area yet. But this might be an area we want to take a look at in the future. OK, and then the final Salar, the Salar uh, Yamara. Uh, this was beyond sort of our interest in this as a paleohydrology question. Uh, I just had a student, Kari Finstad, who finished her PhD on basically the, the, the geochemistry and, and geohydrology of what forms these crusts, how fast they form, and also the sub part of her project she's just finishing is she's working, we were working with Jill Banfield in, my, in our department to look at the, genomic, the, the genetic makeup of the microorganisms that live in this sodium chloride. It's actually another interesting sort of uh, contradiction in the sense that this is the driest place on earth. This is an area of pure sodium chloride and yet the most vibrant life in this entire region tends to be found in the salt crusts that are exposed to the atmosphere. Basically, what's happening at night 
is the salt absorbs water, becomes essentially a brine, and some very salt tolerant cyanobacteria and microbial communities basically are thriving, well, thriving is, I guess, a relative word, but in, within, this, uh, in, within this salt. And so the, the greatest biodiversity is in what would seem to be, uh, at face value, the most inhospitable environment. And to illustrate how inhospitable it is, there's Marco using a jackhammer uh, as we try to excavate a, a pit into this to get at the stratigraphy. But anyway, in this one, uh, there was a marl down at the base, gave us 15,000 years, and then up at the top, there's some sand with sandy material, uh, layered sandy material with some organics that came in at a little over 12,000. So again, this gives us a perspective of sort of the, uh, the, the hydrological history of this area. So putting it together, you know, I'm starting to try to in get myself around the idea of what would this area have looked like at the end of the Pleistocene. And, you know, if you look around the landscape, probably the local rainfall didn't change much. So it'd still be this absolute desert, but interspersed with, uh, you know, vibrant riparian zones and then uh, sort of temporal uh, or or periodic lakes and marshlands in all these what are now salt-covered uh, salt flats. So it's a very different setting that the early inhabitants and, and uh, people that came to South America uh, uh, explored and, and ran across. Up there, th there's this Cape 1 event, Cape 2 event. There's our lakes, Pin Pintados, Bella Vista, Yamara. Basically, we have dates that suggest there was wet conditions for both of those periods. So probably both of these lake systems and salar systems were responding to the regional climate and presumably then would provide a very different habitat for uh, the early inhabitants. So this has already led to us thinking about uh, where to look for archaeology quite differently. So uh, after driving around last summer and showing uh, Caligero and, and Claudio, the work that we'd done, we started to think about some other places that hadn't been explored before. One of them is a cave, well, you can only find this in Chile, a cave in a mountain of pure sodium chloride. And so we, we think that, well, there's evidence that suggests that this cave formed when the region has been cutting down for 10 million years. And this, when the, the, the river system was about at this high, this is probably a dissolution cave that formed early in the Pleistocene. There's actually river gravels in the cave I found this summer that I hadn't recognized before. But we went in to see if there had, was any archaeological evidence. So this is what it looks like into the entrance. Again, this is all salt, a cave of salt. Here's Marco and my colleagues down here looking around. You can see the... These are actually river gravels down here. And then we found a fish uh, bone in there. So this is sort of uh, opening up where and, and when people came through there. And it's sort of an exciting period to work with archaeologists to show them what we're finding and then think about where that, what that might mean for uh, people and occupation of the area. OK, well, I don't have a tremendously long talk, but I want to give you a little uh, overview of this summer. The project was for me to show the archaeologists some of the stuff that we've found, Bill and I and Marco, over the, the last decade. And so we moved south, south of Antofagasta, into what was considered to be a very um, large area without much archaeology, although that is changing as time goes on. One thing that's been discovered. There's been some uh, sites found up in the, uh, some lakes near sort of at the, sort of the pre-Andean area recently. And then there's some sites that have been found along the coast, both in Ant near Antofagasta and further south. But the area where we've been finding a lot of stuff was right out, sort of right in the heart of this hyper-arid zone uh, in the uh, Atacama. We don't have a name for it. The nearest mountain's called Buena Vista, so that's kind of what we're sticking with for the moment. And I don't know what is considered to be an archaeological site, but I'll show you what we found. So, one of so, uh, ten years ago, a colleague of mine from NASA was studying. Uh, he was looking for basalt outcrops in the Atacama Desert, which are hard to find actually, and he wanted to do this 
because Mars is made of basalt and he wanted to look at a true Mars analog so he talked to some geologists and they showed him where this outcrop was and then I went out to look at his soil pit that he had dug and I was more struck by all the artifacts I found around me and so I went back there this summer and it's quite an extensive belt of little outcrops of basalt that seemed to have jasper veins and the people people paleolithic people were coming there to basically use this as a lithic manufacturing site so what you commonly see when you're driving around are these piles of rocks uh, probably uh, shelters that have fallen down this is one of Bill's photos from another area but very similar to what we were looking at this is another area of some of these shelters that have uh, been built and then the stuff in the background here's Claudio uh, I found one of these sites and um, they're dating right now this uh, abalone shell that was on the surface so that'll give us some sense of when people were there and this is a kind of thing you see here but also all up and down the, co uh, the Atacama Desert you see the lithic chippings and then you see these uh, rounded beach cobbles that people brought from the coast inland and then used them as hammers to, uh, to chip the lithics and a lot of these have big dents and indentations on the edge due to hammering and they're sort of dropped there and, and left from, the, uh, for, from their excavations. I took a video once, uh, this is up north near Pasagua, but I was at the coast where the water was coming in and, and sort of rolling these cobbles along. So this is sort of the environment where you get these. But one of the things about this new area that we're exploring is that there's no, uh, well, there's no stream right next to these lithic sites. There's some uh, paleo streams about 30, 40 kilometers away. So unlike Mani, which had a stream running right by it, there, it begs the question, how did they get there? How did they uh, sustain themselves and so forth? So it's 90 miles, 90 kilometers from the ocean. And then the other thing is, what, what did they survive on uh, when they got there? So we're looking at some <clears throat> places in the interior of this desert now that people haven't thought of in terms of Lake Quaternary uh, support of human occupation of habitation but I start to I'm starting to think that indeed there might be evidence that this was a very different area as well probably at the at the turn of the Pleistocene Holocene transition this is an area called Yungai um, it's had a long history of incision there's a dry lake bed out there now and I spent a, a week there this summer and so digging trenches below, getting below the salt crust on the surface, it's a whole different geological world. There's a big thick marl layer. Below that is uh, sandy deposits, probably from maybe along a shoreline. There's, they're non-calcareous. So it was an environment that was producing calcium carbonate, which is a very different geochemical condition today. Apparently it looks like in some sort of water where this uh, marl was accumulating and concentrating. Eventually it dried up and, and it got covered with salt like many places do there. About 30 kilometers from that lithic site is a vast, uh, probably, it's been a wetland off and on for millions of years. It's along a stream that comes out of the Andes. And one of the, I explored this over a couple of days. There's some very recent, um, this is the most recent uh, stratigraphic section. What was striking is on the surface there were remnants fossil, uh, partly decomposed plant material all over the surface. And lots of these little um, uh, still woody material from the, the previous wetland uh, plants that were there. So we're in the process of dating both the plants and the, and the marl and stuff that's underneath the, the surface. There's even outcrops of, this is a thick calcium carbonate layer that probably formed in a lake. Below it is, a, is peat, and then there's fossilized or at least mineralized plant roots and plant material below it. So there's a, there, below the surface of all this salt and dust, again, is, a, is apparently a very vibrant and unique and, and complex sort of late quaternary history of uh, pluvial episodes that uh, we're, we're in the process of uh, dating. So I, I have all these samples. I'm just waiting, hopefully, for a National Geographic proposal to get funded so I can date them. 
So what, this is where we're sort of working now in terms of this is sort of an interesting find, all these lithic sites, manufacturing sites. The question is, were there more permanent settlements in the area? What were the, uh, the res water resources available for these people? And when did this, uh, did this all happen? And ultimately, I guess it, begs the, it brings up the, more, the bigger question of putting together sort of this uh, big human history of the Atacama Desert and sort of, sort of lifting, I guess, some of the, uh, the our perspectives on how arid the region has been over time. There's been oscillations due to changes in the Andes that bring water resources in, and people have certainly exploited this and, uh, and uh, utilized this. I'm going to end with just this uh, figure that came out in uh, Nature earlier this year by uh, folks down at Stanford where they put together this uh, map of known archaeological sites uh, over time periods. And to me, this is, you know, as a geologist, this is very striking how, how so early in human occupation of the, uh, of the Western Hemisphere, the pe people had succeeded in occupying everything from the driest place on Earth to the wettest place on Earth and had spread over this area in such a short time. And so it's interesting to be a part of understanding what's going on in the driest place. And that's kind of where my work is heading over the next few years in, in uh, Chile. So that's all I'm ha I have today. But I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you have.
uh, same thing I had already with these are so fairly, uh, I guess, solid, salt, you know, heavy kind of. Uh, I just let you guys know. Marco's right. Marco, uh, just give a summary of the pollen, phylamus, and uh, So what, what the data suggests is that uh, there was a fluctuation in, uh, in the rates of uh, recharge to the lakes. Probably they went to brine lakes, mm -hmm. salty to more freshwater lakes. Okay. What we have found so far, like the the, the better thing of freshwater are those um, shells, gastropod shells that you can find today uh, around the Altiplano region in, in the lakes there. But we don't know all the fishes or things like that. Okay. What we think though is that the marshes were pretty far, like pretty wide extent and they support vegetation. Mm -hmm. And that vegetation probably also supports some, some uh, mammals, big yeah. mammals. Okay. There are some very old studies that uh, they have found some mammals in the region and probably they support mammals and that was the, the resource for the people there. Excellent. Thank <clears throat> Yes. I was wondering if there's uh, lake cores or other kinds of regional environmental data down at near about 20 degrees south. So I know up in Kitakaka they've been working on that, but maybe not. Well, not, lake, not core specifically to look at uh, lake history, but there have been, as Mark and I were talking about, there have been a lot of coring deep to understand the hydrology, and uh, there have been some oil wells and stuff that have actually been drilled to see if there's oil. But um, we, not specifically coring of these plies to look for uh, environmental history. I think, well, there's kind of an uh, unspoken idea that I think, well, by a lot of us, we maybe didn't pay attention to it accordingly, but that these were ancient things, that they couldn't have possibly been very active recently, at least if we, I never really gave, I gave it a little thought, I guess, early on, but I didn't really ponder it too deeply. So, and then a lot of people, a lot of, some of the papers that have been coming out on biology in these large say that they're ancient, they're and stuff and so forth. So we're starting to get to the point now where we know that they're young, and now maybe the next phase would be to go in and do these uh, you know, sort of drip focused projects to look at the environmental history. Mm -hmm. I noticed that in one of your sections, there was a section that was labeled phytolith analysis. So is that, um, can you talk a little bit more about what's going on with that? Is that Mark? Oh, that's Mark. Yeah. <laughs> so that's actually from the Chile that uh, that. Do that, that uh, that section and uh, well, mostly we found like some grasses and the first uh, event, like the first yeah. moist event, that talk a lot like a, a marshland, and then it tends toward uh, more these mesquite uh, trees. So it's, it tells about uh, trend to our identification. Can I ask you, would, would you say it's just like what you find at the? Uh, uh, in, in the Altiplano because actually two years ago we did a vegetation study on the shores of both Titicaca and also the pole, mm -hmm. which is now dry. Mm -hmm. But when we were there, it was wet. Mm -hmm. And wet her, obviously. And we have a whole range of taxa from that very salty, grimy, drying lake. I would assume it would probably be very similar to what you might be getting hints at. Well, the species that we, we found there mostly would correlate with species that are uh, along the Rio Loa, which oh, is sure, the, sure. the main okay. river that the only perennial surface uh, water that's, that you find in the Atacama, and they're pretty similar. So we right. correlate so with, with have, those. So you can use a picture of, of the Loa. Uh, repairing zones um, yeah, the sense of lake shores. So that's what we are doing, and, and actually the people that it's uh, correlated with. I have yeah. yeah. And are they, is that prosopis still growing there? Yeah. Yes. I had a question. I was just curious about <coughs> the, um, the, the farming terraces that you were finding around that site, Mani. I was wondering what kind of archaeological evidence you were seeing, when they're from, or what period, and then where they're getting the water from. Uh, the water came from the, the, the riparian zone reactivated again uh, during the late Holocene. And uh, the, there's diversion canals that move the water out of the main 
main channel, distributed across the landscape, small fields, little distributary canals. And um, I was, since my focus was on the earlier part, but they have a couple of papers that have been written on the agricultural settlement, and they, in some places, you can actually still see the corn stalks standing in place because it's so dry. Uh, there's corn cobs, even popcorn that have been discovered. So quite a, and as and if you look at it on Google Earth, it's a very uh, extensive area of fields and uh, manipulation of landscapes. So it suggests, at least to me, not an archaeologist, that it's a pretty uh, vibrant uh, uh, human occupation that, that uh, inhabited that area, as well as other other streams probably have similar things in them as well. So it got a lot wetter again than the way yeah. it was. So the first wave were the Paleolithic people, then there's a, a hiatus after those pluvial events, at least, who knows, we'll probably get surprised again, but there's a, a period without archeological evidence so far, and then sort of this late Holocene uh, episode before that dried up and people uh, dispersed as, as a result of the drying up. 